Howdy, howdy, everyone. Welcome to the I Read It for the Plot podcast. We have a very special guest with us today, but before we get started, if you could like, comment, share this podcast, hit that little bell for the notifications for new episodes. If you'd like to have a fun book chat like we're about to now, feel free to reach out and shoot us a DM or an email at I Read for the Plotcast at gmail.com or come hang out in our I Read It For The Plot Discord. I've been having a lot of good book discussions lately with you all, and I hope that you enjoy today's discussion with my very special guest. You probably know her from Instagram, TikTok, pretty much as the Sarah J. Mass expert. So may I introduce Michelle, AKA Michelle from somewhere. Hey, Michelle. Hi, Erin. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, third time's a charm, am I right? <laughs> we have, to our audience members, we had, uh, we're had we having issues recording this episode, and hopefully this goes by more smoothly, because the damn... I'm going to call Riverside out, because they <laughs> keep uh, pausing our recording in the middle of all of this when we're just trying to have a conversation. Come on! Have you seen the movie My Cousin Vinny? Mm, I've seen the scene, the, the epic scene where she's in the trial. Oh, well, there's a line yeah. where they're like, third time's a charm, right? And he was like, not for me. For me, sixth time was a charm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can I can already hear that in the Italian accent. For me, <laughs> six times a charm. <laughs> Brooklyn Italian. <laughs> I, okay. I've t- I, everyone who knows me knows this. I do a terrible overly sarcastic Brooklyn accent when I'm feeling sassy. It's because I grew <laughs> it's because I grew up on Mel Brooks. So <laughs> Yeah. I, I almost thought for a second you were gonna say because I grew up in Brooklyn. <laughs> nope. Nope. Never been to New York. Always wanted to go, but never been. Well now it feels like the promised land. There we go. <laughs> so you are officially the Sarah J. Mass expert, are you not? Oh my gosh, thank you so much. That's so kind. <laughs> I'm blushing. Anytime I go to, uh, anytime I need to go to someone about, you know, if I have questions about Sarah J. Mass or I want to update someone that I know who's uh, like well into the series or um, knows this author really well, uh, then I usually go to you or a couple other friends. But you're like the main person I would go to if I talk to about um, Sarah J. Mass stuff in general. Right. Oh, thank you. That makes me yeah. so happy. It is yeah, the, one, of, one of my favorite topics to talk about, books in general, but especially Sarah J. Mass books. So anyone can always come talk to me about them, but especially you, Erin. Yeah. Would you say you're a massive fan of her series? Oh, God. <laughs> On the spot like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, yes, I clearly would. But <laughs> I had to get that one in because in one of my other recordings, I had it for another joke, but I was like, I cannot let this one go to waste. I cannot. You gotta get it out of your system. <laughs> All right. I will tell you, um, I've only read Throne of Glass and uh, Akatar so far, but I still, I, I'm struggling to get into the Crescent Cities series. Uh, you just finished the, the last book in the series, right? Yes, today, a couple hours ago, I just finished the most recent book uh, of Crescent City 3, House of Flame and Shadow. Um, I love the series, so I would really recommend you read it. I'm trying. Okay, I I, I picked up the book. I read the first couple of pages, and the intro was so slow. It, It felt like, even just reading Throne of Glass, it felt like that frustration of Monty Python and the Holy Grail, the entire chorus going, yes, get on with it. Get on with it. Get on with it! Get on with it! God bless. Well, I think the beginning to Crescent City is a little different than her other series because um, with Throne of Glass and with A Court of Thorns and Roses, especially with A Court of Thorns and Roses, you learn the world as the main character does. And as the main character learns more about the world, that is your exposure to it. But, oh, I'm so sorry. There is a siren going by. Let me. You're in New you York. It's fine. The city okay. that never sleeps. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You're um, good. But with Crescent City, the main character, Bryce, is from that world, part of that world. She already knows the structure. So rather than sort of stop along the way and give you those kind of moments where you're looking into the camera like you're on the office saying, let's stop and explain that to you, you kind of just get the framework of it right at the beginning. 
Um, mm -hmm. But Sarah J. Mass is really good at reminding you what you need to know when you need to know it. So if you're struggling with the first few pages, I would say just skim them. You don't really need to remember it. Yeah, I've caught around that a couple times. Maybe it's just with these other series, because again, I haven't read this one. When you say that she reminds you of this stuff, I have found that she's gone back and changed a few things in the other couple of series. Like she'll change the moment when um, Reese realized that Feyre was his mate. And she'll go back and change little details. I think it's thrown a glass a couple of times. Or little details about their personality or plot points. I wonder how much of that is details changed versus um, like POV changes. Oh, well, no, he said it, it was like in the, what he was describing um, when Reese was describing this, his telling uh, Feyre his whole story. Um, he's like, I realized you were my mate at this point. But then earlier on in the book, he said, I've known since uh, then, like when he felt the bond snap into place. I think he felt the bond snap into place at the end of the first A Court of Thorns and Roses book after, yeah. oh my gosh, like spoiler alert, after she's been turned into Faye already. Uh, that's when it officially clicks in. But I think that stays consistent. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe I, maybe it's just my brain because it's been like a couple of years since I fully read that book, but like my brain is really good at memorizing uh, certain plots or certain stories. So that's the way that my brain remembers it. Maybe. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I would have to go back also. It's been a while since I read the first Akatar book also. Um, mm -hmm. But I know that there's that sort of moment where she's like, oh, why did he just leave that abruptly? Like he had this realization and left. And then later he clarifies that that's why. And sometimes mm -hmm. I, I do think people are like, oh, the character changed so dramatically when in reality it's just through a different person's eyes. So that's why I question mm -hmm. how much of it is deep, like actual changes or a POV uh, change. Or editing also a, an option but it's hard like yeah. without knowing the specific ones <laughs> you mean <laughs> i can't refute it if i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> that's fair so uh how did you get into reading sarah j mass like what was one of the first books of hers that you read that um really captured your love of um the fiction for this the first one I read was A Court of Thorns and Roses, um, mm -hmm. and I actually got into it during the pandemic. Um, one of my friends who is not at all on BookTok or um, Bookstagram or anything like that, we, we'd been chatting, keeping in touch. She lives uh, in North Carolina where I went to school. We, were, uh, we went to college together, and we'd always talked about you know, reading for school versus reading for fun, both big readers. And so she recommended the series to me and was like, I know you haven't read fantasy for a while, but I really think that you should, you should try this series. I think you would really enjoy it. And I need someone to talk about it with. And obviously I didn't have too much else going on <laughs> at the <laughs> time. So I checked them out from the library and uh, more power to people who have self-control of getting one book at a time. <laughs> I just know and don't do that and wait for all of them to be ready. <laughs> and um. I actually got them kind of a funny timing uh, on my birthday. So from the library around my birthday. So I was able to read the gift that is A Court of Thorns and Roses for the first time. Um, and afterwards, I was looking for a way to sort of have a community of people who've read them because all my friends had read Harry Potter, but she's the only mm -hmm. friend who had read these books that I knew in, in person. And I was seeing all of the Harry Potter TikToks at the time. So I just kind of searched Akatar on TikTok and ended up finding this whole community of people. And uh, long story short, here I am. <laughs> well, that being said, like uh, you say that you're only one of your other friends had read this book. Uh, if you were to introduce a friend or a fellow reader to Sarah J. Mass, what series would you start them off with? Would it be Akatar, Crescent City or Throne of Glass? I would always suggest Akatar first. Um, I know some people disagree but for me i think that it is such an accessible entry point into her writing i also think that because the first akatar book could be so self-contained it feels like a lower commitment whereas if you tell someone to start with throne of glass their eyes sort of widen when they see that it's eight books some of them are kind of thick and so it just seems a little more overwhelming to kind of put eight books into someone's arms and say commit right now but i think that akatar is such an accessible point to start both to get used to her writing because being a beauty in the beast retelling it does have the familiarity to the story and i just think that um romanticy is having such a moment right now and so i would say that akatar is the most romance forward whereas i would say you know crescent city is sort of more of the epic i mean throne of glass is more the epic fantasy crescent city more the urban fantasy and akatar the most romanticy 
Yeah, it's. I, I would say that Throne of Glass is definitely more action and adventure than the romance is an actual subplot, not like the main plot. Yeah, uh, like, it definitely yeah. progresses, um, and you definitely fall for the characters and get very attached to their relationships, but mm -hmm. it doesn't play out the same way that Akatar does, I would say. And Throne of Glass is also more of a YA series, so I think when people are looking for that more new adult fantasy romance, Akatar is more likely to scratch that itch. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it does get PG-13 until uh, book, what, five? The beach scene? <laughs> <laughs> I always joke that I think A Court of Silver Flames is Sarah J. Mass's equivalent to like a Disney star doing something a little scandalous to shake the reputation, where I just think that A Court of Silver Flames is her way of saying, for the love of God, stop putting me in YA. Dear God. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> She's like, what more, do, what more do I have to write to make these books adults? <laughs> I honestly, I remember reading that book and the way I like to describe it to other people who have not read it yet is it's literally porn. It's <laughs> the, as no, none of the other books in comparison have as much porn, pornographic stuff as this one. It's just, I don't even remember what the plot was. It's just swords, bang, 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 swords, bang, 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 bang swords, bang. Some, I think... <laughs> some mysticism. I don't know. <laughs> some character development. <laughs> I think that the, the healing journey for Nesta is really impactful beyond that for people who can relate to her. But mm -hmm. I also think that um, Akatar is a lot of people's sort of entry point into spicy books. Um, yes. And I know that people are going to come for me and say, Akatar is not that spicy. I'm not saying it's that spicy. I'm saying that it is a lot of people's first time sort of venturing into spicy literature it, it's a and, good introduction right and so i think that it, it can stand out for sure the shift and how how spicy it gets to to people who aren't used to that but i think it's always done pretty well in that it um it never gets in the way of the plot for me mm -hmm. i get that um there's that, that book was definitely my introduction to smut I liked it, and then I started like uh, feeding into the series, or uh, reading into the series. Like I, uh, that series like fed me while I was in a really, um, I wasn't in a good place when I read it, but it was a good, uh, like ups almost obsession read at the time. Mm -hmm. And from then on, I started reading uh, the other books, uh, other more of that theme. That's where that's definitely where it took off. Uh, Silver Flames. Like I said, that one was just straight up porn. When I got to uh, Throne of Glass, that one I really liked for the adventure and fantasy, but the slow burn, f that frustrated the hell out of me <laughs> for Rowan and Aelin. Because that, that, that slow burn went on for two and a half books. I love, I love that she developed an actual relationship between the two of them before she got any of the sexual tension in there at all. That's that I can really respect because with a lot of these books, it's all about the sexual tension and not about like the actual relationship, uh, whether or not it's healthy or the mis miscommunication tropes and whatnot. It's all for the sake of the drama but, or, or just the sex appeal in general. But these two developed a really great, um, if not, not really healthy in case of how it started out, but definitely one of the best well-developed relationships I think that she's ever done. Even better than, uh, honestly, a lot better than uh, Resand and Feyre, or even Cassian and Nesta. I would say that, yeah, I one thing that's so special about watching Aelin and Rowan's relationship unfold to me is that they both have so much individual healing to do before they can really even consider themselves together. Mm -hmm. um, and that really plays out on the page with just how the dark, the place that they're both, each of them are respectively in and how they sort of help bring each other out of that. But it's still a very personal journey um, that they're helping each other on. And by the time they realize that, oh, we're in this together you've just you're you're waiting for it so i really i really love that um i would say that bryce and hunt in crescent city probably have one of the healthiest relationships on page in any of 
any of their uh, her books. And I know a lot of people find them boring for that, which is so, so heartbreaking because I think a lot of how their relationship plays out is so healthy and realistic. I'm so confused as to the, the story because the way that anyone tries to describe it to me is just that they say, oh, her best friend dies, spoiler alert, <laughs> and then it just kicks off an adventure from there. Like, that's the only detail I'll get because I don't know if the story is like overly complicated to really tell, but I'm still like, is there, but what's the plot? Tell me on the story. Well, so the first one, it's actually interesting you bring that spoiler up because um, that happens very early on in the book. Mm -hmm. And that was in the description of the, the book and sort of the side panel and the blurb that I had of my copy. So I knew that that was happening right away. And apparently they ended up, um, I don't know if it was the publisher, but changing it. So that wasn't in the uh, blurb of the book. And so for me, I never, I always sort of knew what, what, what was going to happen and didn't get attached to that friendship. And other people were so devastated when so early on in the book, yeah. Danica dies um when they loved them so much so i think that's that's sort of interesting how the difference in uh, perception of that but yes yeah, so basically you have that spoiler already so i don't feel bad telling you that but the the premise of the first book is that bryce's best friend dies and she has to work with um hunt to figure out who's responsible mm -hmm. um, but that's so it like is that it <laughs> Well, it's hard, you know, I don't want to get like, into the spoilers of it, but like most Sarah J Mass books, the world might not be everything it seems, and the characters might have to learn and deal with that as they go. And, uh, you know, the enemies change and grow and evolve and uncover uh, larger, larger plots and larger conspiracies as they go. But that's sort of how it starts. And in that initial lens is her just desperately wanting information about what happened to her friend. Oh. Okay. I have seen, um, I have Pinterest. So of course I've seen a lot of the character descriptions. They look extremely random as compared to the two series where it's either humans or fae, maybe one shapeshifter, but it seems like there's a whole different, um, a whole different world of different types of, uh, species and characters in the Crescent City series. Yes, like, there's humans, there's fae, there's angels, there's mermaids, there's shifters of all different species. So it's a very robust world in that way. Hmm. Again, very promising. But the introduction was just so slow. Skim the introduction, get through. <laughs> <sighs> I really think that, you know, if you've liked Akatar and you've liked Throne of Glass by that point, you have a familiarity with how Sarah J Maas creates characters. And so mm -hmm. to sell Crescent City, I feel like that's all I even want to tell people is that if you've fallen in love with Sarah J Maas's characters before, you will fall in love with these characters too. Um, and like her other series, she frames what they go through and the trauma they heal from in a way that's very relatable and hits home for a lot of people and so mm -hmm. it's really easy to see yourself in, in many of the different characters that she creates in this world and i think that it's it's fun and unique to read an urban fantasy novel for me i know it's my, all of my other fantasy reading has been traditionally sort of that more general medieval vibe fantasy <laughs> so <laughs> at first i was like oh she opened her laptop wait she opened her laptop <laughs> Oh my god, um, technology! Yeah, but it was but kind of again, fun to read it that way. But then again, Throne of Glass, not Throne of Glass, Akatar had toilets. Akatar has whatever it needs to have when it needs to have it. <laughs> <laughs> Crescent City, she does a really great job explaining how magic and technology have come to coexist and where technology has been you know, encouraged to fill gaps in the magic. So mm -hmm. I, I would say that if you're wondering, like, well you know, there's no phones in Akatar because they don't need it. They can winnow, they can mind speak, they can do all these other things. Like it really explains to you why the technology is needed and encouraged and developed in Crescent City, which I think makes it, you know, an even stronger tether to the world building and to the, the government system. And again, where it sort of comes into place as, is the world all that it seems? Hmm. Nothing is as it seems. Nothing is ever as it seems in a Sarah J. Mass book. <laughs> you mentioned, um, you know, characters that uh, you could relate to in the Sarah J. Mass universe. Um, that being said, 
Which of her characters in any of the series have you resonated with the most and why? That is always such a good question and, and stumps me because I feel like the answer is whichever I'm reading right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I think, and I always feel weird being like, oh, always the main people. But I feel like when I'm reading Akatar, I do relate so heavily to Feyre. There are parts of Aelin that I really resonate with um, in Throne of Glass. And then there's so much of Bryce that is so, so relatable to me in Crescent City. So I, I love seeing all the sort of different parts of myself in the different journeys these characters go on. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, in different ways for each, I would say that Pharaoh was sort of my, my first one that uh, since I read Akatar first that I really saw myself in, but again, having just very recently done a Crescent City reread and read the new book, it's hard not to see like, well, of course, Bryce, but <laughs> I, I love all of them. What about you? <laughs> Honestly, I've always struggled to relate to the characters in Akatar because I feel like, um, I don't know, maybe I, I, I see myself more so as a, my own individual character. Like if I, if I immersed myself into that series, I would be still me. I'd still be Aaron. Mm -hmm. And then I, I recently did a video, like how I'd react to, uh, you know, uh, meeting the characters from Akatar. That would definitely be me if I was actually in the series. I'd be telling each and every one of them off, like girl, get some fucking standards. My apologies. (laughs) You wipe that smirk off your face for crying out loud. Cassian would be my best bud. That'd be like instant friendship. Lucian as well. I love the the sassy best friend characters more. Again, the kind of woman that would make me question my sexuality, but also best friend character. Um, if anything, I think like she's the one that I would probably relate to the most because of that. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm that kind of fun friend that's always like wanting to stuff my face with food or <laughs> just a tease uh, tease my friends or whatever that. Um, she has that goofy personality that I feel like I can resonate with. Um, but Feyre, uh, she drove me nuts because of like, I know she goes on her own uh, individual healing journey, but she's always very immature. And I feel like at the age that I read that book, I ha- I not only struggled to read that because I'm not the same age as her, but she and I are very different personalities. I can understand her frustration, her distrust, and her anger at the very beginning. But um, yeah, no, I, I struggled to resonate with her. Um, in terms of like Throne of Glass, I couldn't resonate with any of the characters because again, very different personalities. I had a lot of great empathy and sympathy for a lot of them. But if anything, Aelin reminded me of someone that I know in real life, that same kind of spunky, fun, um, cocky personality actually reminded me of a girl that I knew in real life. So, um, that's why I honestly liked her a lot better than Feyre. I couldn't resonate with her, but I adored that. I adore Aelin as like a little sister energy, like I did that other friend. Oh, interesting. So, that makes yeah. it, that's very endearing then to her, or to you rather, by her as a character. I would say one thing that for me, I think like Sarah J. Mass just does so well is, you know, writing these responses to, to hardship and trauma in the characters and how a lot of them respond differently and mm-hmm. in all in realistic ways. And so I think... Like, of course, the scenarios that these characters are in are not always relatable to me, given that I've never had to fight a giant worm. But <laughs> I would say that, and let's hope I don't have to, but I would also I, say I, that- I would do it. I would do it. Give me a freaking sword. I will, I, 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 I will make worm my meat. Uh, what is yeah, that? I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't know where I was going. I'm happy that. that you know how you would react in that scenario, but I hope you're never in it. Yeah, thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I would say that you know, seeing how the different characters respond to what's happening around them is really the part that I, I latch on to, even if the scenario isn't relatable to me in itself. And I think that's where you know, I feel like with Akatar, people are always like, "Oh, are you a Feyre or a Nesta?" And mm-hmm. kind of how you how you respond to things and how you react. And I think that. You know, Feyre always really wanting to believe the best in people until it goes too far or until she realizes, like, now's the time to kind of full send. She gets bloodthirsty mm-hmm. in those moments. And I think that's what I really resonate yeah. with is the, like, look, I I want to be nice. I want to do the most for people. But then once you sort of lose that, I you're never getting that back. And um, 
same thing like Aelin, sure, like, no, I'm not some <laughs> person on a journey for a kingdom. But I think the way that she sort of takes so much personal burden on herself for others mm -hmm. and doesn't always clue people in on her plans. <laughs> She is the I, definition of a miscommunication trope. <laughs> I think she's the definition of I did the whole group project myself yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for a lot of the books. And so I think it's those sort of those traits that we can really latch on to and, and how we see ourselves in those characters, even if we haven't been in the similar situations. Yeah. Okay. That I can, that I can see. <laughs> uh, you've uh, talked about in your own content, a lot about how Sarah J. Mass has, um, integrated a lot of Jewish culture into her writing. Can you give us some examples here? Yeah. Um, so this is actually one of my my favorite things when it sort of hits me when I'm reading and I realize that I think it's so beautiful. So yeah, Sarah J. Mass is Jewish. And I think that um, seeing sort of cultural things that become very normal to you as a person being used in this fantasy way makes you realize how special certain rituals or certain practices are. Um, and so one of the, the ones I always think back to is actually in Throne of Glass. I, I'm going to say no spoilers as if any of this hasn't already been full of spoilers, <laughs> but someone passes away mm -hmm. and um, Aelin visits, visits their grave and leaves a stone. And she says that you know, in, in Terracin, you leave stones on graves, never flowers, because stones are eternal and flowers die. Um, and that's actually a Jewish custom. So you leave stones on graves um, in, in Judaism and, and on Jewish graves, you leave stones. For that reason, they're eternal. And even if you're um, offering condolences to someone, you don't send flowers. Huh, so that that's... was a, a really beautiful moment of to see, especially because the scene is so beautiful. So that's one example I wonder if that's where the idea of gravestones came from. Um, I think they're they're different because hmm. the gravestones are more of markers. Um, but I yeah, I would need to definitely read more about that before I say anything hmm. confidently yeah. about that. Some other examples. I mean, that's one in Throne of Glass. In there's a few others in Throne of Glass too. There's one moment where um, I know the the least read book. Everyone kind of skips Tower of Dawn, but there's a I moment may in... have skipped that one. Oh, well, <laughs> there's a moment in something called the womb in Tower of Dawn that's very similar to a Jewish uh, practice called the mikvah, um, which uh, I don't want to then go into because you haven't read it, but uh, go you ahead. I, I already, I, plug. I, I, I'm already on the last book. I'm like halfway through it, but she got to a part that annoyed me, so I stopped. <laughs> don't give up. Um, also in Akatar, just some of the stories used, like Miriam, um, freeing an enslaved people, bringing them across, a, across the desert and parting the sea, mm -hmm. Amran being sort of a biblical angel and um, the citizens of Valaris painting lamb's blood on their door so that she passes them over mm -hmm. their houses. I mean, that when she's looking for oh. the, the bad guys, those are both just so reminiscent of the Passover story in Judaism. Um, a lot of the names are Hebrew names that she uses, even the... Um, the book and uh, like the book of the breathing in Akatar is written in Hebrew. <laughs> the sort of old language Son is just Hebrew. A... Yeah. <laughs> so there's there's a lot of a lot of examples that she brings the culture into that I think are are really a fun little if you know you know for other Jewish people reading it, but also a really nice way of making you know like I said things that become very normal seem so fantastical and beautiful. Huh. Yeah, I'm not Jewish, so I did not know. <laughs> yeah, oh, a lot of people don't. That's that's part of why I started making the series, because I was talking with my uh, friends about Akatar, and they were lost when I mentioned how, how much Judaism is in these books. My God. Or my... Uh, what What is the Hebrew word for God? I know, I know it at the top <laughs> of my head. I want to say Iwa. Um, well, in hmm. Judaism, you don't really pronounce um god that way so in prayers you would say adonai but most you know those of us who speak english would just say god <laughs> oh there yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh my god so again like um you got into uh 
Throat of Glass and uh, After Akatar. Wait, what? In what order did you read the the, the Sarah J. Mass books? Did you start with Akatar, then Throne of Glass, and then Crescent City, or yes? Okay. I, that exactly started with Akatar. That was my my entry point. Then read Throne of Glass because um, I read Throne of Glass right before book two of Crescent City was um, like I knew that book two was coming out, but there was still a decent amount of time in between when I wanted to read the next book and when that book was coming out. So I kind of figured, let me read Throne of Glass first and then start Crescent City so that when I finished book one, book two would be closer to being released. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, like I said, I'm still on the last book of the Throne of Glass series. She annoyed me, not just because she was taking, again, too damn slow. But I think she just got, it, it was she or, was it she that did the other trope or the one I don't? I don't know, I'll come back to that later. But okay. Because <laughs> again, it's been like maybe a couple months since I picked it up and I started reading something else. Um, okay, so... Sarah J. Mass books, uh, book lovers, what other series would you recommend to people who like uh, Sarah J. Mass readers or Sarah J. Mass reading? Yeah, um, I would say it's first important to isolate which part of the Sarah J. Mass books you really like, because mm -hmm. I think that Sarah J. Mass uses a lot of, you know, familiar lore and fairy tales in her stories. So if that's sort of the part that you like, I would find other authors and stories who do retellings. Um, I know that there's a lot of really popular Hades and Persephone retellings and Greek mythology retellings as well. Yeah. Um, some, I know, I know we've spoken about how you don't like some of them. No, I've only <laughs> read one of them. Uh, it was just poorly written and I'm going to, I can already hear the friend of mine who loves this series. I can already feel her like grabbing her phone to, to text me like, don't you start trashing this series again. <laughs> <laughs> um, if romantic is more your vibe, I would find series that focus on that. I mean, I feel like it's always so cliche to say because so many mm -hmm. of the big popular ones are, are, you know, nothing unique that I'm recommending, but fourth wing is so much fun. If you like romantic <laughs> I um, loved Fourth Wing. At least yeah, the first like one. Yeah, Dragon School with yes. romance. I mean, it's so fun. With very, uh, well, I, I wouldn't call that romance, but that's uh, definitely spice. <clears throat> <laughs> Yeah. I would say, you know, it's it's a mix and match there. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's it's a good uh action adventure with uh Silver Flames level uh, Silver Flames level smut. <laughs> Not as consistent, but definitely as a graphic. Yeah, a lot of people yeah. who specifically like Sarah J Mass also really like the From Blood and Ash series by Jennifer Armentrout. I loved that book. I don't know um, why. I just <laughs> Yeah, there's it's got that sort of like adventure, romanticy spirit mm -hmm. to it. Um, I personally, I know we disagree on this one. I'm sorry, but I have to say it. I love Holly Black, so I would always say it is not similar to Akatar, but if you just like fantasy and Fae, I love The Cruel Prince. I would have loved it as a teenager, but I could not love it as a 30 year old woman. I just think Holly Black is so efficiently emotional in her writing. I don't know. Like, I love flowery prose. I'm a sucker for prose, and I will fully admit that. <laughs> but Holly Black's writing is so efficient and brief, and in one sentence can just knock the wind out of you. Oh. Okay, and I never thought of it like that, because, again, I've only read the first book, and then I was like, okay, I can't bring myself to put my through this myself through this again, so I just read, like, the Wikipedia summaries of the next <laughs> few books. But have you ever, like, read a more eventful prologue than in The Cruel Prince? When uh, so much just happens in the prologue, I'm like, oh, wow, I need to, like, fat, like buckle well, my seatbelt. I don't know. I mean, the first, uh, well, actually, another book by um, Jennifer Armentrout is, I've, I've talked about this book. I have yet to do an actual book review on it because this book doesn't need a plot. It doesn't really need a plot, but it's got a very interesting prologue. Kind of creepy, but um, I'd still recommend to this book for someone who just needs, like, a cleanse, if anything. Mm -hmm. uh, Fall of Wrath, of Ruin and Wrath. I always want to say Wrath and Ruin because that rolls off the tongue more easily. But the, it does have an interesting prologue where it's the main character when she's a child. And, uh, you know, you get a glimpse into how she meets her future love interest and um, you get a glimpse into what her true identity is and a little foreshadowing as to where, as to the purpose of um, their future relationship. And 
it's it's honestly it is very eventful excuse me it's um it or not even eventful but it does have a huge impact on her later on in the story so i will say that okay i haven't yeah. read that one yet i've read um the first four in sort of that main series in from blood and ash so like from blood and ash up to the war of two queens mm -hmm. I, I that i i've read the first two books in that series i got the third one i have yet to start it because i'm in the middle of another book right now the the traitor queen um the second book of the uh the bridge kingdom series Oh, I've heard really good things about the Bridge Kingdom, but I haven't I read highly that yet. I highly recommend it. It's it is a romanticy, but it's more um, it's like an epic or e economic e economic fantasy than anything else. Really great world building. Um, I will say there's a it's like a whitewashed uh, half the book is like a whitewashed version of the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> But it's uh, very well written, very great storytelling, good slow burn, great teasing. You always gotta love a good tease because that's how the characters Absolutely. like. Absolutely. Yeah, that's how they develop like their witty relationships, and that's what I love. Like the witty banter's, those always get me. Um, but no, like the, the reason I loved it so much was because of the world building. It didn't even need the romance. It didn't even need the smut. It could be like it could be young adult level. Um, uh, spice, which is barely any spice at all, and I would still love this book because it was so well written. It, the, the, the world building is that great. Oh, I love good yeah. world building. Yeah. I think that's one of the main reasons world building is so important to me when people ask, you know, why do you like fantasy specifically as a genre? Mm -hmm. I think that you know, obviously there are so many amazing authors telling amazing stories, but an author who can tell an amazing story and basically from scratch build an amazing world that I believe whether that's like with magic systems or just their geography like there's so many things that go into world building and it's so impressive to me when an author successfully builds and an, a really believable fantasy world mm -hmm. um and that just like elevates the the writing and the my my trust in the author to such a like instant sort of respect yeah, for that really something that really immerses you in the story like just enough um, creativity and writing style, especially. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I think that there are so many things that are so easy to mess up when world building. Oh, God. <laughs> so yes. an author who really creates this like tight world where, you know, you can poke apart at it and it, it holds up. I just think is a different level of, of creativity and it just really is so impressive to me in the genre. Mm hmm. Uh, I think I recommended you this series before. Have you ever read The Dresden Files by Jim Butcher? I have not. Okay, if you like good world building and modern urban fantasy, I highly recommend this series. Okay, it's set in Chicago. And this author, he includes incredible uh, multicultural um, fantasies and mythologies. He'll even add like three of them in one book. But you get, he's very well descriptive. He is a little bit slow, but he's a slow that I'm patient with. <laughs> and he, phenomenal characters, phenomenal dialogue. It is basically Harry Potter, but American and rated R. Like if, like if Deadpool went to Hogwarts. Or no, no, if Deadpool went to- What an uh, elevator pitch. <laughs> I'm sorry, it really is. It's just, that's the best summary for it. Deadpool level humor. But um, if uh, if Harry Potter was like an American stoic, overly sarcastic older man, so <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm uh, sorry. He, I, we don't even know what age he's in when uh, we start the series. Like, I'm guessing mid thirties. I'm guessing. Yeah, you yeah. have recommended them to me before, so I definitely want to put them on my list. Especially, like I said, I'm a sucker for good world building. I highly um, recommend it. First book is Stormfront. I think one of the things that when I say it's so impressive, because there's so many things to, to mess up mm -hmm. things that I'm someone that like some people are so good at just reading for the vibe. And I wish I was one of those people, but any sort of, I don't want to say, even say errors, like sure, grammar errors, spelling errors, word choice errors, but also just sort of glaring holes in world building take me out of the story. Mm-hmm. And so that's part of when I say it's so impressive to me when an author can 
pull it off like when you poke at the world and it doesn't unravel because I'm sitting there every time I read poking at the world. <laughs> poking at the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've all, I don't want to say we've all as a generalization, but I'm sure many of us have read a fantasy world that frankly falls apart if you blow too hard on it. Well, for me, that was, that was the cruel prince. <laughs> Because she just kept going back and forth between, like, the modern human realm and the fey realm. It's like, it, it, the way that, um, the, oh, I think we just paused again. Hold on. Oh, for crying out loud. Oh, we made it so far that time. I know. Okay, now it's going up again. Now this part I can edit out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, for me, that was the Cruel Prince. Uh, she just kept going f back and forth between, like, the fantasy realm and the, the modern day world. And it just drove me nuts because... And the way that she does it, like, writing toads through, like, that one little shift. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and I just think it's fun and whimsical with that part. I don't know. It didn't bother me in, in Cruel Prince. The one thing that did, though, I have to admit, it didn't bother me, but it did take me right out, was um, at one point they were like, let's go to the mall and put on, and I quote, jeggings. <laughs> <laughs> and I can honestly say it was the first time I've ever seen the word jeggings in my fantasy books. Um, I but felt so... Like I felt so sorry for the oldest sister because she's supposed to be the eldest and the responsible one. She really is, but she she's living in a fantasy realm in her head. And that's the only way that she can cope with all the trauma that she's experienced. Oh, absolutely. And all, all of the sisters are coping differently, which again, I really appreciate when an author shows you that. That's kind of mm -hmm. going back to Sarah J. Mass. One of my favorite things is that when encountering even the same scenarios, Feyre, Nesta, and Elaine are all going to have very different reactions from uh, to it, rather. But I will say with Cruel Prince, one of my favorite things that Holly Black does is um, she uses a lot of sort of common fey lore, but mm -hmm. you don't have to know fey lore to understand what's happening in her series. So it sort of adds a deeper level of understanding if you want to. So like, for example, you know, one of the characters in Cruel Prince is a red cap and you don't have to know anything about red cap lore to appreciate what the characters go through in the Cruel Prince. But if you do sort of know the nature of red caps, it makes sort of the relationship between, um, between the characters more impactful because you realize like how much of it is, is fighting nature, how much of nature can be fought and you understand why these characters have such a, a difficult relationship. So I really do like the um, added level that can be your choice for how deep you want to go in the series. I also like that all of her series actually take place in the same world. So even if the characters aren't present, um, the sort of like Holly Black universe of Elfheim is uh, all, across all her different books. Hmm. Again, I've only read the first one, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's really cool to read it because even though like the characters might not even appear in other books, it's sort of, you know, to the point of world building creates this very large tapestry of what her world is. Do you ever fan cast actors as uh, for your uh, for your series? For the I book series that you don't. Like? People are always asking me who I would fan cast. And honestly, I am the worst at it because I am so bad at keeping up with tv shows and movies people are like oh did you watch this no have you seen no and so i really never know who the new relevant actors are i can keep up with a few of them but only because like i'm on social media for so much uh but i can't i can't watch any of the hip uh netflix shows anymore because we canceled our subscription they got too expensive for us is that especially but, with uh their new policies people are having yeah. a lot of issues with that yeah no kidding but I feel like I have all of these streaming services and I really half the time only more than half the time watch Peacock because they have all of The Office, like all of Parks and Rec, go. Harry Potter, and I love The Real Housewives and they have all the Real Housewives uh. franchises. <laughs> but back to the fan casting, the entire time I was <laughs> She's like, reading... how do I get away yeah. from that topic? Sorry. As quickly as I'm not <laughs> When I was reading The Cruel Prince, I imagined two actors as the characters. Uh, Jenny Ortega from Wednesday and um, 
Timothy Chalamet, I think that's how you pronounce his name, as mm-hmm. uh, Cardin and Jude. Oh, I think they would be great. Yeah. I loved Cardin and Jude so much. And there is <laughs> there is one actress I can imagine playing Aelin. I, ca- I cannot pronounce her name, though. It's uh, Sh- uh, Shirnan Caprica, or whatever it is. She's a girl that plays Sabrina from the uh, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina from the Netflix series. I don't think you you were right. <laughs> You're the second person to tell me that. I honestly think that she could she'd be spot on because Oh she... no, I mean about your pronunciation. <laughs> oh, oh, about the pronunciation. Okay. Cause I already got torn into someone about it. Because I'm trying to press the matter like I'm pretty sure she could play Aelin. And they're like, no, 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 she doesn't have this, she doesn't have that. She's got the swagger, she's got the attitude, she's blonde. <laughs> Oh, no, that's subjective. You're yeah. totally, your opinions on that are totally valid. I just think that how you pronounced her name is objectively wrong. <laughs> oh, because I said paprika, didn't I? <laughs> <Something like that. laughs> that's a spice. <laughs> I think it's cured in Shipka, but now I'm second guessing myself. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, no, now I got to Google it real quick. So, <laughs> cured in... And I'm already spelling it wrong. Kieran, it, it's Kiernan, I think, right? Kiernan. Okay, not Kieran oh Knightley. Now I'm second guessing myself. Oh, wait. Shapika. Shipi, Shipka. Shipka. What the fuck is a Shipka? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's her name. Don't be rude. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, look. I have met so many great people in my life who I would immediately name a character after. One of them, uh, Oh, God, I wanted to name a character after this person's last name so badly. Uh, uh, Stone Cipher. Ooh, but, that's a good one. Yeah, Stone Cipher. Like, I have a list of people's names that I've seen in, or read in real life, and I'm like, oh, okay, no, this would be a great character name. This would be a great character name. That's just the writer side of my brain going on. Um, I went completely off tangent there. But, yes, no, this girl from uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, the Netflix version, I think she would make a great Aelin. I was upset when they canceled that. I thought that was fun. It did go off a, a, like a little off the rails at the end, but it was still fun. It's always like the third season when the writing, no, even the, sometimes the second season when the writing just gets too bad and the writing and the writers are just like, oh no, we can't even keep up with this shit anymore. We can't fix this. You know what? I love like campy horror things. Like I wouldn't even, call, not that that's horror, but you know what I mean? Like something that's like still gory and dark and has this like, more occult imagery and witchy stuff but isn't necessarily scary and still kind of is campy Mm -hmm. i love that genre (laughs) i thought they did a great job they had they had so much potential but then it just got then with like so many so many shows it becomes all about the drama and not about the story yeah i think it's always hard when you're responding to the audience's ratings and what they want to see but then also in your head where you want your story to go there's always sort of the the what do you owe to to fans and what what do you owe to storytelling yeah honestly i'd still focus on the storytelling because the fans they're gonna get tired of it if it's just all about like everyone else's opinion but uh especially when it comes to like readers and writers if you just go by someone else's story then it's not even your or someone else's opinion it's not even your story anymore so if normally I would agree with you, but my exception is that I cannot believe that the Vampire Diaries never gave us Caroline. Uh, <laughs> that yes. is my Roman Empire. <laughs> well, they did for a brief moment. Klaus and Caroline had too much chemistry to not make them endgame. And I will die on that hill. Uh, they could have been like... <laughs> No, they were too toxic for he was way too toxic for her for her. I'm sorry. The fans but, wanted it. The fans wanted it. They got it. it. They got it. Not they got enough. The, they got their final kiss, okay? They got their they hands don't up sexy. Up together. Okay, they didn't get to go to Paris together, but they got their moment in New Orleans together. It's not they should have ended up together. No. You don't give me a character saying <laughs> he's your first love, but I intend to be your last. How could he have known? And then just never get together. I will not. This is like, I have trust issues. I do not forgive and I do not forget. Ugh. Uh, <laughs> no, no. The Vampire Diaries is like the definition of dr- uh, all about the drama gone wrong. I think that it was the best teen supernatural <laughs> soap opera possibly could have been for a very long time. 
For, uh, for they a gave CW us more show. drama in an episode than some shows gave us in a full season. And for that, I will be eternally grateful. Okay. I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm such a Vampire Diaries girl. I will rewatch that like every October around Halloween. But I will somehow, despite having seen it multiple times, always, always hope that somehow the ending changed and that Klaus and Caroline end up together. I can see that. I mean, I'm sure there's fan fictions that you could read uh, for those who oh, eventually do get a And out. I have. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's that TikTok sound? It's like, do not cite the ancient, do not cite the deep text at me. I was there when it was written. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, uh, it's Aslan. Do not cite the deep magic to me. Which yes. I was there when it was written. Yes. Me about Caroline fan fiction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I still, the, the closest thing to fan fiction I've ever read was a touch of darkness and maybe a page of Fifty Shades of Grey before I wanted to throw the book at the wall because of all the grammar errors in one paragraph. I think fan fiction is so interesting, like that it exists in this sort of very delicate balance of, you know, it's okay, but mm -hmm. you know, to an extent, don't obviously you can't make money off it, any of that thing. So I always think it's well, so neat people when do authors, now. authors publish it. Well, People yeah, but they, like, they change all the names and a couple of the defining characteristics. Yeah. So I kind of love the, like, that fan fiction gets published. I think that people look so down on fan fiction. <laughs> and it's just, people are doing this for free. They're writing this for free. And I don't expect it, like, I don't, I don't get upset when people say a book is written like fan fiction and people get offended by that because it, like, kind of makes fan fiction writers catch a stray. And, mm -hmm. like... I, I see why that bothers people. But at the same time, I, to me, that phrase means that like fan fiction isn't typically held to any universal editing standard. And some people take the editing of fanfic very seriously, but there's no sort of universal standard or expectation of doing so. Mm -hmm. And so I think when people say, you know, the book is written like fan fiction, they don't necessarily mean the, the talent or, or quality of the writing. They mean the quality of the editing. Yeah. Honestly, write whatever you want, whatever story you want, uh, fanfic the hell of it. Just please use proper grammar. That's all I'm asking. Because, okay, one of my biggest pet peeves, and I realize I do this myself, um, word repetition. Mm -hmm. uh, this comes from uh, when I realized I had this pet peeve. I read a book that was written by a friend of mine's mom. And this was when we just got out of high school and she actually came into our class one day to talk to us about editing or about uh, publishing your own book. And I remember one of the first things she ever said was that an editor will edit out at least half of your story. I'm surprised he didn't do a more thorough job because every single time this woman described a character moving from one place to another, whether it was from the door to the stairs, from one end of the hall to another, she always used one word. Meander. Oh. They That's meander that could be used a couple times, but maybe not every time. Yeah. Oh, funnily enough, a friend of mine who's rereading Akatar, every single time she spotted the word meander in the book, she then texted me a picture of it. She's like, oh, look at this, meander. Oh, look at this, meander. Meander here, meander there. I'm like, oh my god, I'm never reading Akatar ever again now. Because <laughs> that word now is a pet peeve of mine. Because it was used every single time. It and reminds just... me of when people say, like, tell authors it's okay to use the word said. Thank you! <laughs> yes! You can also use whispered or, you know, but said is a perfectly fine word. Okay. You know what? There are times, though, or not, I, I got to defend authors in uncertain scenarios because mm -hmm. I think, you know, imagery of what you're really trying to show the reader can be so important. And so obviously I'm not defending the person whose book I didn't read who used the word meander that many times. But when I think of meander, I immediately think of like a river. And so if you're really trying to conjure up that imagery of, of you know, using water metaphors or similes and a character sort of having the fluidity of a river then having them meander is a really subtle way of continuing to to get that point across but of course that's in the larger conversation of of doing all of this imagery well <laughs> yeah but quick question um so now that i've just revealed my biggest pet peeve which i've probably gone <laughs> on about multiple times before but um what is one of your biggest pet peeves about writing? Or do you have any of them 
Is there anything about Sarah J. Mass's writing that triggers one of your pet peeves? Oh my gosh, biggest pet peeves. Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I probably have a lot. <laughs> because like I said, I, I do read for a lot of small details. So I'm actually a very critical reader. And I wish I could just read more for the vibe of it. Um, I, I Editing has a, has a lot of my pet peeve chokeholds, really. I think that so many wonderful stories are just... N- you know, not living up to their full potential because of the the lack of editing, whether that's developmental editing or line editing. And I think that there are so many times that I'm reading where changing one detail or including one detail could have led to so much more significant of an emotional payoff for the reader. And I, I know that sounds so ridiculous to say that's my biggest pet peeve, but when a scene really could have more payoff, but doesn't live up to its full potential. Um, like the almost fight scene in uh, Breaking Dawn? <laughs> Twilight. Oh, we're really getting into Twilight. I love Twilight. I, pub- I publicly love Twilight. <laughs> I, I I I went through a phase back in high school. It's not a phase, mom. <laughs> I had to get the fuck out of it, honestly. But um, no, like uh, that that was one of the most biggest. That was the biggest writing disappointments I think I've ever read. Where she led this whole thing. You got two friggin' armies, one in yeah. front of the other. At least the movie gave us that potential battle scene and said, "Oh, by the way, this is what could have happened." God, yeah. don't you hate when diplomacy works? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I actually do agree that Breaking Dawn, there, you know, it led up to something and then really did not, no flat. Did, did not live up to it. But um, I, I just really do love Twilight. I don't know what, I, it just hits. I reread Twilight for the first time since I was like a tween last year with uh, with my friend. We did a buddy read and we just did the first book and we were kind of expecting now that we're grown to have a completely different reaction to it. And the whole time we were just like, damn, book Edward still hits. <laughs> I love it. I actually, this is, I went on a um, trip to Washington with my, uh, with my brother. And when he was like, what kind of stuff do you want to do? Like, where should we see? Cause I'm, I'm the itinerary oh, girl in a, in a, in a trip. I love planning travel. So did you go um, to uh, La Push Beach? Well, I wanted to go to the rainforest that's in uh, Olympic national park and you Ooh. go to it to access it. You actually go through forks. And so <laughs> Oh. I did make him, my brother go to Forks with me who and he's never read or watched Twilight. Um, oh god. And I was like buzzing with excitement in the in the front seat of the car and he was like what is wrong with you? Like this is <laughs> this looks like any other sort of pass through American town like where you just like go like you know it's the the mouth of the where you enter the park like he's like it's not spa-. and I'm like bouncing and the whole time <laughs> He's like looking at me like I'm insane, and I'm just going. Ha, 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 ha. Oh my god! <laughs> and honestly, like justice for that blue filter they used, because I gotta say, it oh was god. blue as hell there. <laughs> really? So it was accurate? Yeah, it was really blue. <laughs> oh my like, god! Because it's so cloudy and rainy there, and. If like photographers know that cloudy, rainy weather is actually like very blue tinted in photographs. Ooh. Okay. Now I'm gonna have to take a trip up there just to see that. That sounds beautiful. <laughs> it the the nature there is really amazing and definitely makes you feel like you better hold on tight, Spider Monkey. Oh my God! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I'm such I don't know what it is. I love I love fandoms. I have existed in fandom spaces for so much of my life now. And I think that's part of, you know, being in the Sarah J. Mass fandom. It just, I've always loved being in fandom spaces. Um, they're fun. And it's like so when you fun. meet someone, that it's it's like making an instant friend too. You can have that instant connection with a total stranger if you like just the same book. Yeah. Or if you, and yeah. like, or if you both resonate with the character. Resonating with characters and scenarios, especially to me, because like, I don't care if you like or dislike a character. I care why you like or dislike a character. Like I am, I've said publicly 
on the internet pub, like multiple times in my TikToks, etc. Like some of like I'm fine with haters. I'm a hater, but some of y'all do not hate correctly. And if you're gonna <laughs> hate someone, you have to back it up. <laughs> I see that a lot with Tamlin. Like, I think it's fine to hate Tamlin, but some of the reasons that people are like things that people accuse Tamlin of are just not true. <laughs> Honestly, I'm going to say this, and I think I've said this in another episode before. I never hated Tamlin. I was pissed off with him because he was being freaking annoying, but I don't know. It just, uh, I always saw that even when he was being a douchebag, there was still always some good in him, but it just never got cultivated properly. You know? Yeah, I think I, I'm kind of a Tamlin apologist because I think that like, I don't think Feyre owes Tamlin forgiveness, let me be clear. But I think that people are very quick to discount the trauma that Tamlin had also just gone through under the mountain. And obviously like the way they were coping or not coping, mm -hmm. it like wasn't compatible with each other. And the way that Feyre changed after the events of under the mountain, like under the mountain versus who she was before it, like she changed a lot and obviously they were no longer compatible. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying he handled everything correctly. He no. objectively did not, but mm -hmm. I don't think that makes him irredeemable with how no, much he's he absolutely also just gone redeemable. through. He's absolutely redeemable. Uh, and I look forward to his redemption arc, hopefully in the next book. I think, yeah, like, I think that's one thing she does also so well is the like, deeply flawed characters. And I think it's so funny. One thing I've talked about a lot with her characters is that people love in general to say that they love a morally gray character mm -hmm. until that character actually does anything morally gray. And suddenly it's like surprised Pikachu meme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah because people are like oh my god i can't believe that character did it and i was like a minute ago you were telling me you loved how morally gray they were and like like how, how hot that shit is but uh excuse you <laughs> right and i think that's what makes her characters so easy to latch onto is again how not perfect they are no. um and i think like one of my all-time favorite villains is is mave in throne of glass yeah um, I think she's such a good villain because there's always part of you that's sort of questioning her and like whether what she's doing in a certain scenario like makes sense or not. And when you actually hear her, you know, backstory of why she wanted to leave her world, it's like, yeah, I don't actually blame you. It's just kind of how you handled it once you got here. Yeah, no, and, oh and you can tell that everything that she's doing, even the, all the strings that she's pulling, it's all a self-defense mode, if anything right. else. She's yeah. such an interesting villain, and I really just love how so much of her, like, decision-making is kind of understandable, but then, like, well, you shouldn't have gone that far, though. Uh, and, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, did, I'm not defending her, she's Sarah, a villain, but she's a when, good villain. When do Sarah J. Mass characters ever do the bare minimum when it comes right. to that stuff? <laughs> Period. When do they ever do the bare minimum? Yeah. And so I think, you know, and so much of, of perspective and POV comes into play in her characters also with like whose story you're hearing at the time. And people always kind of say like, oh, well, Reese is so different in Akatar and Ak like Akatar through Akka War than he is in Akka Sif. And it's like, is he that different? Or were you just reading him through Feyre's eyes and now you're reading him through Nesta's eyes? I actually have a theory about that. Like the, he does, okay, there's something about him, um, definitely, you know, it's, I get the perspective, but something about his behavior that's, that's similar, it's more so to Tamlin's than his own personal behavior, than, you know, his usual stuff, like the overprotectiveness, especially, you know, when it comes to the baby, understandable, like you want to protect the mother of your child, but the way that he literally had her shield herself, I don't know, there's something about that seemed familiar, and something that I theorized, you could totally, you know, discredit me, or tell me I'm wrong, <laughs> um, when Feyre was uh, given all the gifts from the High Lords, she took a piece mm -hmm. of them with her. What if something, uh, Tamlin, what if some part of Tamlin was also transferred into Reese? Not just a part of his own life force, but, you know, kind of like how in Harry Potter, a part of um, Voldemort was living inside of him. So a part of him was always like uh, similar to Voldemort. Yeah, I mean, all the High Lords also gave a piece of themselves to Reese yeah. for him to live in Akawar. So that's definitely something that we haven't seen or explored yet um, because, you know, he wasn't really the feature in Akasif. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I think like the the keeping things from her is also an interesting example because even without the theories, just like taking what we have at face value, do I agree with him from keeping that she might Mm-mm. die from her? No, but once again, like when you talk about how none of her characters are perfect, people forget that recent Farah made that vow that if one of them dies, they both die. Mm-hmm. So now he's trying to navigate that as well. On top of the fact that this is his first time ever dealing with this scenario also. <laughs> and it's deeply emotional for him because that's the love of his life and his mate and his baby. And so I'm not, I don't think he handled it correctly, but I think that the way people are like, he's a monster for that. Like, he's just not perfect. No. And here's the thing. Okay, something I've always said, Sarah never writes very mature characters that the most mature, even even the most mature of them, uh, has some kind of childlike quality to them, and I think that's honestly, I think that's either Azriel or um, Amran. Either one of those could be the most mature character. The only thing immature about um, Azriel is that he has a, a torch, or is, is still carrying a torch for more, um, even though he knows that she doesn't love him back in that way, and the way that he, you know, behaves about it sometimes is you know not very well handled at all so i just think yeah like and no character she writes can be just accused of being perfect and even the ones that we think are we realize that that might have been a pov thing like reese Mm -hmm. seems so perfect in aquilar because pharaoh's so in love with reese i never fell in love with reese not even through pharaoh's pov (laughs) really no i was a cassian girl and from like the moment Cassian was uh, introduced, and I was a I was a Lucian girl. Like, okay, I I'm actually as soon as I read him in that book, I was like, oh, I like this guy. What the hell is she doing with Tamlin? Like- I love Lucian. <laughs> Lucian is another one that the way that people talk about his character change, like, I take it so personally, not like literally, but like, give Lucian a break. He has yeah. gone through so much, forgetting like. Anything that even happened before Akatar, Akatar starts off with one of his good friends getting killed, mm-hmm. then the killer having to suddenly show up and him be nice to her. Then he goes through all of that trauma under the mountain. Let's not forget that he is oh, repeatedly yeah. tortured under the mountain. Mm-hmm. Then he goes and has his like friends betray him multiple times. Like Talon's basically his brother. He goes through what's functionally a breakup after being like assaulted by Ianthi mm-hmm. goes into this journey where he's hunted by his own family, ends up in the night court. The people that he's told his whole life are monsters suddenly has his whole world blown and they never even show him around or give him a tour. <laughs> because they so don't like, trust him because they've also thought of him as the enemy for so long. Right. And people are like, wow, Lucian was a lot funnier in book one. He like really lost his personality in like book two and three. And I'm just like, can you blame him? Lucian a break. He's traumatized. And he did try. He tried to be there for Feyre. He tried the best that he could. He, he, he really, really tried, tried to be a good friend. He really tried. Yeah. And I love my girl Feyre, but she wasn't as good a friend to him. Nope, she was not. I don't think she knew how to be. Because she never I had agree. friends. Right. She never really had friends she was learning how Lucian to love and have first... friends for the first time Lucian was her very first friend when you think about it yeah and then she finds like her found family in the night court and everything but she's learning how to be a friend and and again she's not perfect so when she no. kind of makes promises to Lucian she doesn't keep or uses him at times like she's learning also <laughs> none of these characters are perfect and i think that's what makes them so relatable and why so many of us relate to so many different ones of them but also like i don't not many series have people who cling and relate so deeply to so many side characters thank you yes it's so special the way she's able to make all of these characters so real even when they're not the main character yeah well cassian does eventually well cast yeah Yeah. but i tend to think of side characters in sjm books as like characters who don't really get pov chapters what are some uh fan theories for uh akatar that you'd like but could probably disprove in a heartbeat oh that's a hard one Um, I, i i like the one i like I like the theory that uh, Tamlin and Elaine are mates, but there's one, but there's an instant way to disprove that. 
And that's in the third book when Feyre glimpses into Lucian's mind and she can sense the mating bond there. So this is kind of hard for me because I don't want to spoil anything in Crescent City for you. And I feel like in my head... It it might entice me to read the book. (laughs) Well, I just feel like all three series are just like, you know how people talk about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the MCU? Yeah. I think about the mass literary universe as the MLU. (laughs) So it's just like one giant connected universe to me. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't... So I feel like it's... I don't know. Because so many theories are fun but yeah could very easily be disproved i think the ones that are about relationships are probably always the most fun Mm -hmm. um because obviously we all want to see our our characters happy um but i don't i just i trust sarah j mass so much that even with the relationship ones like people are always like oh do you think asriel should end up with gwen or with elaine and i'm just like Mm -hmm. she'll convince me either way (laughs) I just trust her so wholeheartedly to convince me to see it her way. Um, So I don't know. I'm really curious to see more about Elaine's arc with her as a seer. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of fun theories center around her. I hate, hate, hate the theory that Cassian won't survive. Yeah, I know. I just Because people are like, when Elaine says, when he's like, it's not that easy to kill me or whatever. And Elaine goes, or... Elaine something goes, like that yes, or, or so, yeah like yes it is or something like that mm-hmm. i'm like i i reject this energy <laughs> i don't want this um, i don't know maybe maybe she was just foreshadowing the fact that he almost died like twice in the third book because uh in the battles with the with the hyper i hope so yeah let's, um, let's hope let's pray it ends it there but oh, yeah i okay. i can't i can't think of that um i like the thought that you know, a lot of people are upset that we never ended up getting the um, threesome scene in Akasif. So I think- You got a glimpse of it. <laughs> I think it'd be actually fun if we got that with Elaine, Gwen, and Asriel instead. Oh, I mean, that's one way to do it. <laughs> yeah, like, okay, the people want it. I think that would mm-hmm. be fun. Um, I don't know that I think she'll do it, but <laughs> I don't know. What, what are your favorite theories? I feel like they're hard to conjure up on the spot. Honestly, the, the Tamlin one was one of my favorites. Another one was that uh, Azrael and Reese's uh, lost uh, um, the deceased sister, the one that was murdered by Tamlin's yeah. family, that they were mates. But oh, wouldn't that have been yeah. disproven if they'd known each other their whole lives? Like, wouldn't his sister have been around, uh, raised with him and, uh, and the other Illyrian warriors, him and Cassian? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I see that one. I agree with you. I feel like that would have been maybe clear at a certain point already I, speaking of Azrael, i mean of reese's family theories i also i it's so easy so much easier for me to talk about the theories i hate than the ones i like wow yeah. um, <laughs> i don't like when people theorize that tamlin has their wings i thought he said he destroyed them people don't believe him they think that that's why like oh no he told- Pharaoh- Pharaoh was never in tamlin's room and tamlin always went to Pharaoh's. was because reese he's not the trophy guy I'm and sorry, that's how but, I feel. Yeah. I'm like, do you like when that first Faye died and they like and Pharaoh like held him as he was dying, and then Reese went and and I mean, sorry, Reese Tamlin went and buried him. Mm-hmm. Like that just does not seem like the guy that's keeping the wings as trophies, especially when Reese was his friend and like he that's the reason that he lost his family. Like I don't think he would want that trophy. No, and his father was the was more the trophy guy, but he's definitely not. And I think that the people right. that say that are probably still trying to villainize Tamlin because they cannot forgive him for what he did. Well, in, totally, in and that's exactly what I mean by when I say, like, people hate him, but not correctly. <laughs> there you go. Like, you can hate Tamlin. I don't care, but not for things he didn't do. <laughs> All right, we're going to close off the episode here. Michelle... Thank you so much for joining me today. I really loved this book talk. Uh, we're going to have to get together again here soon. And after I finally get this damn Crescent City book started. Yes. <laughs> I will keep I'm you updated. In progress. All right, wait, wait, should I just listen to the audiobook? Um, I don't really listen to audiobooks, so I can't recommend or not because I don't know if it's a good one. But if yeah. you're an audiobook person, then while, while you're doing your embroidery, you should. Maybe. Maybe I can get Henry to read it for me. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the Tamlin Henry? 
Anyways, okay. So again, uh, thank you for joining me today to our audience. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's episode almost as much as the book you are currently reading. Stay safe, my friends, and have a wonderful day. Till next time.